Last class we have discussed this case. Uh, this is a patient of a 60 year old, um, 60 year old man uh, who complained of sudden onset breathlessness. Uh, our diagnosis was uh, in a uh, uh, right upper lobe, uh, uh, mass malignancy, and uh, right lower lobe. Uh, <coughs> Uh, yeah, that lower one we had thought of. I had thought of idle hernia or something, no? Yes. Yeah, okay. Uh, so we are then this one lateral, it looks so different. Hmm. Okay, so the patient was referred to Tata Hospital. Hmm. Uh, his biopsy was done. Uh, on the list of the, uh, Excisional biopsy or percutaneous biopsy? CT guided. Sorry? CT guided. Mm -hmm. Before the report of this uh, patient. Uh, but why is the biopsy not done here? Because the patient went to Tata. They refer to Tata. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah. Uh, this the right upper lobe was given as uh, chronic inflammation, and uh, right lower lobe uh, lesion was given as uh, squamous cell carcinoma. Can we go back and see? <clears throat> Do we have biopsy pictures of the actual biopsy? Because the one that's posterior here is very unlikely to be an uh, squamous cell carcinoma. They don't form fluid levels like that. No, this region is squamous. Which one? I'm talking about two lesions here. Hmm. That cavity like, that is squamous cell. fluid level. Huh. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Cavity, exact fluid level is unusual. Huh. It will cavitate, but it doesn't form fluid levels. So, I'm wondering whether they've mistaken the two sections. Now, the upper one is a space occupying mass. It's not just a pneumonia like thing. And it's compressing and displacing the trachea. So, to think of that as an inflammatory lesion is very unusual. In which case, what inflammation can occupy space like this? Which which lesion? No, no inflammatory lesion. There's something called inflammatory pseudo tumor which contains a lot of uh, plasma cells. So if it was inflammatory pseudo tumor, it still doesn't displace the fissure down, and they will report a lot of plasma cells in that region. So you have to check back and tell them that are you sure? that this is squamous cell carcinoma and that is an inflammatory lesion or whether they have... So I want to see uh, the patients pay for the scan. CT. Then they should give us pictures done during the uh, uh, CT guided biopsy of the position of the needle. This is very very unlike a squamous cell carcinoma, the lower one. If there was a breakdown, I can understand, but a fluid level like this is unusual. And that being an inflammatory lesion is also unusual. They simply said inflammatory. Yes, sir. Can I switch off that sit down one of the lights? Is it possible there? Is it there or no? Yes, sir. What have they said? Right lower lobe. Right upper lobe. I see. Chronic inflamed lung parenchyma. No granuloma seen. No tumor seen. Mm. See that deep cuts does not reveal any additional finding. Mm. That's fine. The question is whether the two samples were exchanged or not. The patient has been transferred there. Yes. Just confirm with them, no? If if it is possible. <coughs> Often when you talk to the path, do we have previous X-rays here? Last time I don't remember. If, I mean, there is TB on the opposite side. I don't think we discussed there is TB on the opposite side. Anyway, so. I simply cannot believe that the upper lobe region is inflammation. So talk to the pathologist and say this is what we are looking at, the definite mass, which inflammatory region produces a mass like this. 
Ja? Ja, danke. Last time was there any homework? I said read up something, something. Anybody? Who's the lady who was keeping a uh, yeah? Are you keeping track of the stuff? There's nothing? What is wrong with the way the x-rays have been done? What is this picture called? Talk loudly here. Yeah. Have you seen it being done? No? You should see it being done. Yeah? Anyone knows how this picture is obtained? Do we have it here? I mean, I remember we have the software to obtain whole, whole we have it here, right? So have you seen it being done? So all of you should see how a scanogram is done and how the images are put together. Yeah, for one thing it is fun. The second thing is you should know so that you know what the drawbacks. Come on this side, no? All of you come on this side. No, one of you has to operate there. Yeah, where it is. Sure. Okay, other you come on that side. <coughs> So you also get an idea of where all it can be used and uh, where it cannot be used and when it is done, what the fallacies of the scanogram can be. Okay. What is wrong with the way the x-ray has been done? There's, I want one answer, one line answer. The rest of it can come later. In fact, when I ask this question about x-rays, there's only one answer. All the time, only one answer. And it is always there, every single time. Anyone? The gonads have not been shielded. It is not acceptable. Yeah, you see it every single time that the gonads are exposed, after it matters not. It is not about this patient, it is a philosophy that you don't care. So that cannot translate. So every time when you see something like this, call the technician and say that for God's sake, shield the gonads. What would you do if this is your child, if you're a boy or girl? I, I insist on this because the... <clears throat> The level of awareness of radiation protection among technologists is really low. And it is really low because they have followed a tradition. They have not really learned, but they have been pushing buttons and learning how to do. They have had no theoretical classes on radiation safety. It's your duty to call them and tell them nicely, please don't do it again. And they are not supposed to do it. You have to supervise. As residents, you have to learn from them and you should know what is not right and you should tell them this is not right, don't do it. Yeah. So how do you approach this whole thing about this child? This was an 11 year old child. Yeah, 11 year old what? 11 year old boy. Yeah. He was referred from Idea Hospital for skeletal surgery. And he was The patient came with the mother or? With father, who's seen the patient? I have seen. You take pictures? Yes, you have got clinical pictures? So yeah, so you should show it to everybody because what you see on x-ray is so simple. But when you see the patient, actual patient, it is, it's so profound. Yeah, and often we don't get to, so in the digital teaching file of this patient, you should have the clinical photograph, not on your phone alone. Yeah. Did you take permission from the patient before taking the pictures? Yeah, I took permission from father. From? Father. Father, no? Good. So, how do you approach this? Uh, in an exam, you are shown a scanogram like this. You have not seen the patient. You don't know what the hell is going on. How do you approach? And you don't know what the disease is. Polytrauma, it is metabolic bone disease or whether it's a dysplasia or whether it's some spinal deformity, how do you approach? Well, 
No, how do you approach? I mean, I don't want description. How do you think? In an exam, you have no, not much time to think. No history. Here, you've seen the patient, you know what it is. So, how do you approach a patient like this, where a scanogram is done, in thinking what this could be? When it when was the first uh, time he was uh, investigated for that? When, when was the first time? You are not getting my question. My question is simple. You have, suppose you are not seeing this patient and you are shown this x-ray in the exam. How do you triage? How do you think about what this could be? Time when the x-ray was taken. Sorry? Time when the x-ray was taken. It is in the night. Yeah, all that is fine. Night time, all that is. But why would you take a scanogram like this in night time? Which one? Trauma. Yeah, if there is polytrauma, somebody could do a whole limb tomogram. Yeah, okay. Any other indication? So you don't see a single trauma, right? So you say that, okay, this may not be trauma. Anything else which is strikingly abnormal here? You've seen the child, so you should be knowing, yeah? What? Short limbs. No, before that? How was the child looking? The child was obese and short. Obese. The first thing is obese. You see evidence of that here? So you will always start with the soft tissues. Even if it was polytrauma, for example, to know where the underlying trauma is, you should make it a habit that I will look at the soft tissues in bones no matter what. Anytime you see a bone x-ray, you have to look at soft tissues. Whether it is congenital infection, neoplastic metabolic miscellaneous. Each time looking at soft tissues, what is the thing I say? There is no smoke without fire. So if the soft tissue is abnormal in a particular area, you look at the underlying bone more carefully. More carefully means what? What do I mean when I say more carefully? I told you this several times. You should magnify and you should change the windows. Magnification in bone is a must. It's not optional extra. Every single time you see a bone lesion, you have to magnify. Whether it's a hand with polytrauma, or it is a metabolic bone disease. So you have this luxury now of digital images. Okay, in a region of... The first thing I do is light, reduce the light. I don't think it automatically come, my, comes to my brain that there is too much light. So if, if at your age, you make it a habit to reduce lamp, any bright light would strike you. So viewing conditions are not important. So I'm automatically looking at soft tissues. And because I have no looked at virtues of this, uh, this disease, I know how they look like. That's why the first question I ask you, have you seen the patient? And please share that picture with all of them. And the clinical photo, I'm, I'm very happy that you ask pictures to be taken. I mean, you're at least thinking of clinical photographs. Yeah, I would want uh, as many clinical photographs on your cell phone as there are x-rays. I'm sure there are a whole lot of x-rays on your cell phone. How do you take x-ray on the cell phone? How do you take a picture of the x-ray of an x-ray on the cell phone? What is the right way to do it? Anyone? Most phones will have a grayscale mode or black and white mode. You are not supposed to take it on normal mode. Go to the black and white mode because it completely changes the way the pictures look like. If you don't believe me, take a picture in gray in ordinary phone and take a picture in grayscale and see the difference. There's a huge difference because the number of the number of pixels available is now shared with only grayscale, not three colors. So the resolution automatically improves. So I don't want anyone who is listening to me now to ever take an x-ray in full color. Go take the trouble of going manual, grayscale or true black and white, something like that is there and taking it in grayscale, okay? Now, <clears throat> so the first thing that you see is that this bachu is ob obese. The second thing that you see is what? Short. Short chacha maybe. What else? <laughs> yeah, that's fine. What else? Before all that, you are trying to differentiate congenital, metabolic, neoplastic, infective, miscellaneous, etc., etc. How do you do that here? Yeah, bone density, what, before that? 
Now you're coming to specifics. I'm looking at the whole picture. One in the whole picture is that the bachu is very fat. The second thing is the bachu looks short. There's some dwarfism going on. But what is the third thing? Anyone? Every bone is affected. There is no single normal bone. So you see that the tibia, femurs, the pelvis, everything is abnormal. Even the ribs look abnormal. So you have multiple bones. The fact that you are shown a scanogram means there is something multiple. And we discuss what it could be. It could be any of these things. And then you have every bone affected. You know that this is a skeletal dysplasia or a metabolic bone disease. Now you differentiate between skeletal dysplasia and metabolic bone disease. How do you do that? Biochemical markers. No, radiology. Bone density. Yeah, one is bone density. So you can have increased bone density in say osteopetrosis. It's possible. And you can have increased bone density in secondary hyperparathyroidism. Bone density by itself is one good marker but not the marker. So which is useful? Bone trabecular pattern. Yeah, in metabolic bone disease, invariably the trabecular pattern is abnormal. For example, zoom this. Can you zoom any bone? You are on Nirfan view. Okay, then. Okay. I thought you were on this thing. Now you see, yeah, just mag it show just femurs. Okay, now describe what you see. Pelvis with hips and femurs. There is bilateral symmetrical shortening. Sorry, of I can't hear. There is bilateral symmetrical shortening of femurs. Okay. With uh, flaring of metaphysis with irregularity. Yeah. And uh, there is also irregularity of bilateral uh, distal femoral and proximal tibial. And distal femoral and proximal and tibial, what? Deformity, what do you say? Deformity. Okay, yeah. And in uh, upper femoral epiphysis are also deformed. Okay, if you want to describe it in short, what would you say? What is the define? One is the limbs are short, that's fine. That immediately tells you that this is dwarfism. You have to differentiate between central dwarfism and peripheral isomelic or melomelic dwarfism. <coughs> Here you see that the spine, yeah, we'll come to the spine a little later. Come, what is one way by which you can describe all the abnormalities here? So, is there primary abnormality at the epiphysis, which is an epiphyseal dysplasia, or is it at the metaphysis? Sorry? I said, where is the primary one? Can't say today, Sunday or Monday means it can be anything. Where is the primary abnormality? Yeah. yeah. How you tell the primary abnormality is at the metaphysis because the metaphysis is sclerosis. So describe the metaphysis here. There is a flaring of metaphysis. One is flaring. So every bone is affected. The main changes are in the metaphysis. The metaphysis is flared. Then, then there is irregular. <coughs> Sorry. There is irregular and sclerosis. <coughs> so it's flared. They are irregular and sclerosis. and so that's rickets, isn't it? It looks like rickets to me. Flaring of the metaphysis with uh, sclerosis, which is rickets uh, treated, and then you mentioned about <coughs> flaring. Sclerosis and widening. All of this could be rickets. And this is what the problem is. Very often, these virtues are treated as rickets. Why is this not rickets? Bone density is normal. Yeah, very good. So, bone density is near normal, right? In rickets, you would expect it to be, a, will be less. Okay. One. Normal. Sorry? Trabecular. Also normal, yeah, okay. What is one? Keep magging. Mag, mag, mag. <laughs> I want to see just the metaphysis, distal metaphysis of the femur. Are you able to mag more? It will go on. Reform you keeps going. <laughs> You're not able to go.
You have to scroll from the this thing toolbar. I mean, from the scroll bar here on the right. Okay, doesn't matter. Okay. In Irfan, you cannot move the image. You just use the scroll bar on the right. Is this rickets? Now tell me one reason why it's not rickets. You mentioned or whatever you wanted to do. Any more reason? Important reason? If the metaphysis is abnormal, then the physics can be secondarily involved, but in the case it never so much involved. So that one more reason. Anything else? <clears throat> okay, soft tissue. No, all that is okay. I'm just talking about the metaphysics. Can you mag? Can you try magging? Yeah, move the scroll bar from the right. Move it up or down, whatever. Move it down. Yeah, you have to move it down. Yeah, mag it more. Keep mag. Still, still, and move the scroll bar. Left to, left to right scroll bar. <laughs> now, if you look at the ankle joint here, you don't have that brush border appearance. The line is very dark, very symmetric. And it doesn't show the classical blush border appearance that you see in rickets. The second thing is that that line of the metaphysis that you see is deeply cupped, cupped, and it shows local sclerosis. In rickets, first of all, you do, you will get a brush border appearance, and the sclerosis is over a period of time, so it's not so localized. And here, every every <coughs> metaphysis is involved. In rickets, only the weight bearing metaphysis that are involved and the most important thing here with along with flaring there is sclerosis and there is no brush border once you realize that there is no brush border appearance and the bone density is normal the diagnosis is only one every time there is this condition it is mistaken for rickets what is that condition this is open and shut this is the one, one second diagnosis what is the diagnosis here? Sorry? I can't hear you talk loudly. <coughs> the question was, what is the diagnosis? No, skeletal dysplasia is like saying I saw a bus. I'm asking you which route VST bus. So there is a metaphysical abnormality universally in the in all bones what displays is it most likely to be uh, sorry have you tried to read around this have you tried to read around this in met if it's only metaphysis then achondroplasia no metaphysis this is not met uh, achondroplasia at all so this is metaphysical dysplasia i call it open and shut metaphysical dysplasia because it's classical you look at the spine, there is posterior displacement of one of the vertebrae, or I mean, beaking. Wait, we'll come to the spine a little later. I want all of you to remember this particular picture of the metaphysis. There is no brush border appearance, and there's a lot of sclerosis. So, when you see this kind of brush border, I mean, lack of blood border, uh, brush border appearance and sclerosis, and secondary epiphyseal changes where the epiphysis is fragmented. In, in rickets, you don't see. Uh, fragmented epiphysis. In fact, you don't see epiphysis because they are not ossified. This epiphyseal abnormality that you see, irregularity, fragmentation, is classical of a dysplasia. It is not seen in rickets. It may be epiphyseal dysplasia or it may be metaphyseal dysplasia. Here, the metaphysis is obviously abnormal and therefore it is a secondary change in the epiphysis. So this is a metaphysical dysplasia because there is shortening, because all bones are affected, because metaphysis are abnormal and this is not rickets. You have to know this condition because frequently a wrong diagnosis of rickets is made and the patient is given tons of vitamin <coughs> D and nothing happens and patients are always hopeful. You met the father, right? How did it feel to meet the father? What is the one question that he asked you? 
Exactly. Every single time, the parents will ask you the same question: Will my uh, will my child become normal? Or sometimes they'll ask: Bina operation ke tik hoega kya? What did you say? Wishy washy. What did you say? I said that regular follow-up will be needed. Yeah. So when you don't know exactly, you you can either say that I don't know or whatever, whatever. But the real truth is that this is what I tell the child. Pura height kabi ho hoga hi nahi. Okay. That you are lucky that there is nothing else wrong. You have to accept the child as it is. Do you know the heredity of this? How is it transmitted? Read about it, right? So, so this is one thing that you should read about. This is a common dysplasia which you will get to see in only in places like this. In Kokila Ben, in five years, I have not seen one. But in KM, you will see one every year or one, two every year. So, this is very common in our country. Very common in KM. You should know everything about metaphyseal dysplasia, including how many types are there. Sorry. There are seven varieties. I mean, at least I know seven varieties of metaphyseal dysplasia. You said forty-six. Only metaphyseal and forty, but only metaphyseal and seven. Yeah. So only metaphyseal are seven seven varieties. Yeah. When I was a student, it was four varieties. Now it has become seven. It may or may not be important to class sub classify. If you are in KEM, you have to sub classify. You have to say that this is. Say sparse type of metaphyseal dysplasia, whatever. And here the spine is also abnormal. Just show the spine. Be mine. Somebody has to read. Sorry, what happened? So you said that the metaphyses are primarily affected in the epiphyses. The yeah, always, epiphysis. always. The epiphyses, if it is affected, the metaphyses remain small. So in multiple epiphyseal dysplasia, for example, the growth of the bone will not be affected. It will be multiple fragmented, and uh, when the metaphyses are affected, even if you take, uh, for example, rickets, the epiphysis is small. It is not fragmented and it is not ossified. So when our Brown disease, for example, when the metaphyses are abnormal, the corresponding epiphysis is also abnormal. So if you look at the spine, what do you see? A spine. No, you have to make it a little bigger. I can't see much of the spine. What is the main abnormality in the spine, which tells you that this is a dysplasia? There is a there is decreased height of the vertebrae with central uh, projection, central tongue and projection. Yeah, so there is a central bicky of a vertebra. What are it is L one? We are in college. We are in telemedicine. No, I did it. Yeah, it's okay. Carry on. So this is a variety of spondylometaphyseal dysplasia, which is a small thing and is really badly syndromic. Has the patient been treated with uh, uh, with steroids or something? No. Was the face popped off big? No, only the limbs. Um, so how old is this child now? Do we have hand X-rays? Eleven years old. Huh? Eleven years old. Yeah. So the reason they are so uh, abnormally fat. <laughs> Either the bones are not growing, but the soft tissues are growing, and instead of being whatever height they have to be, they are really short. So this is spondylometaphyseal dysplasia. And what do you want to ask you? You have hand X-rays? Yes. Now this hand X-ray changes the whole thing. Yeah, why does it change the whole thing? Because the metaphyses are abnormal. 
No, that's okay. Now I I said that this is a metaphyseal dysplasia. Looking at the hand, I am changing the diagnosis completely. The hand X-ray is very useful to differentiate all forms of metaphyseal dysplasia and epiphyseal dysplasia from MPS. Okay. okay. If you mag 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 the base of the metacarpals. And this differentiation is extremely important. The bases of the metacarpals are pointing. They are they are, like, they are not horizontal like that. And when you see that in changes which look like metaphyseal dysplasia, then it is hunters or hurlers, which is the common variety. The child is mentally normal or abnormal? Mentally normal. Therefore, it is hunter. So this is open and shut. So when I'm not sure whether it's not spondylo epiphyseal dysplasia or spondylo metaphyseal dysplasia, which is not common, or MPS, you look at the hand X-ray. That is the only X-ray that you need to look at. And when you see pointing of the base, now let me look at the right hand. The fourth so metacarpal is the classic one here. Right hand. Fourth metacarpal base, yeah, that's the one which is classically pointing. And when you see something like that, you see it elsewhere in different forms. This is an MPS, yeah. And the child is normal, so most likely this is hunters. And they've done a spot test, urine spot. So let them work up, work it up for hunters' disease rather than spondylo metaphyseal dysplasia, which is an uncommon variety. Spondylo epiphyseal is common. Spondylo metaphyseal is not common. The common differential diagnostic problem is spondylo epiphyseal dysplasia from MPS. Yeah, and you just have to look at the metacarpal base to tell one from the other. In in um, non MPS syndromes, the base of the metacarpal is flat, like the one that you see in the first metacarpal. Yeah, that's that's the some normal variety you see. But in MPS, it is always pointed. So for all practical, practical purposes, I have made up my mind. I might be wrong, I might be right. But mostly, I'm, I'm saying that this is MPS, categorical. Yeah? So let's get a follow-up on this, right? This is from our genetic clinic or from outside? From Vardia Hospital. Uh, Referred to here, to the our genetic clinic. Yeah. So we'll get a follow-up on that. Okay. So you read about the uh, the genetic transmission of this, and then talk to the father again and find out how many siblings are affected, how many family trees are affected. That's when he enters the who is not. Okay. And then you have to ask about the family history from the father's side and family history from the mother's side, yeah, and what their face when they talk. Because if it's from the mother's child, often the mother will deny in front of the father. You have to be careful, yeah? What is the bone age here? How do you tell the bone age from hand x-ray? We've gone through that. Cardinal Means what? Appearance of I ask a simple question. How do you tell the bone age from hand? You can't say I look at the carpal bones. Then you explain. Yeah. 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 Mm. Yeah, then a six, uh, seven so, based on the number carpal bones, how do you tell the age? Uh, at three months, then four months, yeah. Four months, then two carpal bones. Very good, yeah. And then uh, three carpals at three years. No, three carpals at four years. So it keeps decreasing. Yeah. If you have eight, seven carpal bones, it is six years, and piece form comes at. 10 years, okay, whatever, I mean, read from the books, my, my, my uh, learning is that PC form is 10 years and two carpal bones are at 4 months, lower end of the radius, 2 and a half years, lower end of the alba, these numbers, what I say, you look at the books and confirm, right, lower end of the alna, 5 years, so easy to remember, two carpal bones, at four months, three carpal bones at two years, and so on till PC form, which comes at ten years, and then you have the lower end of the radius, two and a half years, lower end of the ulna, five years. But what is the correct way to measure bone age? 
this is every day i mean you can use this every day but if you are doing some study for example looking at sportsmen's age so that they don't cheat on junior league or senior league what is the correct way of counting bone age do you know of somebody's name right yeah right tanner white tanner white white Tanner White. Tanner White, yeah, sorry. Tanner White way of scoring. And I think I told you about this. This is from Western population. It tediously scores every metaphysis, every epiphysis, and somehow I don't like it because it's Western population. Now, how can you look at every small thing and then apply Western population to our country, but it's still accepted for legal purposes? So you have Tanner White measurement for multiple. You have to know it, at least the name. Because you might be asked in the theory, or you might be asked uh, in an exam during practicals. In our department at Kokila Ben, for all genetic purposes, we use the Tanner White Wells method. Yeah. Okay, so let's see what happens on this. The thing that also struck me, I mean, I should have thought of that, is that children with spondyloepiphyseal or spondylometaphyseal dysplasia don't look like this. They are not huge. They are normal looking. They are dwarfs. But this child is classical hurlers or hunters depending upon mentation. Hunter and hurler have more or less the same radiological appearances. Hunter is normal mentation and hurler is mentally retarded. Yeah.